This video will illustrate the construction of a truth tree to say if an argument is valid or invalid. For the most part, I'm going to suppose that you know the basic tree method, and in this video all I'm doing is kind of highlighting the important things and demonstrating the method. If you're unfamiliar with the method, then you should watch the introduction to truth trees for validity. All right, the first step of the method, it, here's our argument. We've got three premises and then the conclusion. And we know that the first step is to set up the counterexample. This is really easy. If you think about a table, a counterexample is a row that makes all the premises true and the conclusion false. Well, when we do a tree, we want to start with the counterexample. So the setup for the tree is to take all the formulas and stack them one on top of the other. With the premises, you just list them. Listing them is basically making them true. And then we're going to take the conclusion, and since we want to make the conclusion false, what we're going to do is negate it. So here I have the counterexample for the argument. I like to put a line underneath that, so I say, well, my setup is above it. My work will be down below it. As we know, what the tree is going to do is check to see if the setup makes sense. All right. Uh, the second step is to start applying the rules. Here's all our tree rules, and what each rule does is break up a formula by its main connective in terms of the elements that would make it true. We want to use stacking rules first. And so let's take a look at each of our main connectives and see if any of these are stacking rules. First of all, we have an arrow. Well, that's obviously branching. We'd like to hold off if we can. Notice next we have just a sentence letter by itself. Actually, you don't have to do anything at all with a single sentence letter. Sometimes people like to rewrite it underneath this line so that they don't forget about it. But actually, you don't have to do anything with it. It's here to cause contradictions later on. Tilde R wedge M. Well, here the main connective is the wedge. And since it's a wedge, we see, well, that's obviously a branching rule as well. Be really careful. If this had parentheses around it, then the tilde would be the main connective, and you'd be using this rule. But since there are no parentheses, tilde R itself is P, M is Q, and it's a branching rule. All right, now we have tilde M double arrow R. Well, I come down here. Yes, both of the double, rule, double arrow rules also involve branches. Well, it turns out that every single line here involves a branch. So it actually doesn't matter where I, be, will be, where I begin. When it doesn't matter, my default is to go up to the top and work from there. This is a branching rule. Let's just start by putting in a nice wide branch. And notice wide branches are good, especially for your first step. Now we're using the rule for the arrow. It says negate the antecedent. So I'm going to put tilde m on one side. And that says just put Q on the other side. All right, so put S arrow R over there. I just applied the rule for the arrow to line one. Now every time that you apply a rule, you then check for contradictions, which is the third step of the method. Remember that each branch or pathway through the tree is an attempt to make the setup make sense. If a branch or a path contradicts itself, well, then it doesn't make sense, and we can close the branch. It's really simple. Here we see tilde m at the bottom of the branch. Let's follow the branch all the way up to the top. Do we find an m by itself any place? And the answer is no, we don't. There's an m, but it's not by itself. There's another m, it's not by itself. Another m, not by itself. We're looking for just a single capital M, and we don't find it. All right, on the other side, here's S arrow R. Well, this is actually another exposed connective, so here we have a choice. I need to work on this arrow. Should I go back up to the top and work there, or should I work here? The truth is it doesn't really matter, but I much prefer to work here so that I don't forget about it later. This is another arrow. We know that arrows are branches, and the rule says 
negate the antecedent, put the consequent on the other side. Well, let's check. Do either of these close? This is a tilde s. I follow up straight to the top. I do not find an s by itself. I see the r. I follow up. I do not find tilde r. At this point, we have three open branches. There's actually an important thing that I should probably mention. When I just applied the rule for s arrow r, I applied it here. Why didn't I also apply it below tilde m? The rule is very simple. When you apply a rule to a line in your tree, you apply that rule to all of the things below it. So if I was working on tilde r wedge m, it would go underneath all the open branches. But when I'm working on s arrow r, I don't want to go back up the tree and over. It only gets applied below where it exists. Think of, think of applying rules as water running down the framework of the tree. All right, well, as a matter of fact, I'm at step three right now, and that is to work on tilde r wedge m, and there are three open branches below it. And so this rule is going to have to get applied underneath all three of these open branches. And it's the same thing in all places. Tilde R, M. Tilde R, M. Tilde R, M. Well, let's hope a bunch of these will close. We applied the rule. Now we check for contradictions. Tilde R. Is it open or closed? Well, if I follow up the path, the most direct route to the top, I do pass this R right here, and that causes this to close. The M branch, well, yes, it contradicts tilde M, obviously, and so it will close. Now I look over here, tilde R, most direct route to the top. Ah, yes, there's an R there, causes it to close. M does not close, tilde R it closes. This time there's an R even closer by. And the M, it remains open. At this point I've got two open branches and I've got one more place to work. So step number four will be to apply this. Where does it go? Well, obviously it goes underneath the two M's that I have. Notice this is a negated double arrow. To make a double arrow false on the table you have to have different values for the parts. So if you make P true, you make Q false, and vice versa. So that's what this is saying. Basically, take the components, M and R, and put them underneath both sides of the branch. On one side, negate the first one. On the other side, negate the other one. Same thing over here. Tilde M, R, M, tilde R. Well, all we have to do now is check to see if all of these branches are open or closed. First branch. Well, we see that here's the R. I don't find a tilde R any place by itself, but I do find a contradiction with M and tilde M. I only need any single contradiction. Doesn't have to be with the last thing on the branch. Doesn't have to be with both parts. Tilde R and M. Here's a tilde R. And there's the R, causes it to close. Here we see that the M and the tilde M causes it to close. And then on this side we see that the R and the tilde R cause it to close. Every single branch closed. Since every branch closed, that tells us that the argument is valid. The fourth step is just to read the answer. Why, why does this tree tell us that the argument is valid? It's because every branch is an attempt to make sense of the setup. If you get a contradiction, it says, well, this attempt didn't make sense. All of our attempts failed to make sense of the setup. The setup was a counterexample, so the counterexample doesn't make sense. If the counterexample doesn't make sense, then the argument is valid. Before I finish this video, I should demonstrate that, in fact, this particular argument has a much shorter tree. That sometimes, if you're creative about the order in which you apply rules, you can work more efficiently. So, 
my default when I'm doing trees is always to start at the top and work down. But notice what the conclusion was, a negated double arrow. Double arrows tend to give you a lot of information when you break them up. And it doesn't always work this way, but quite frequently, if you start with double arrows, you can get more efficient trees. So, instead of working one, three, four in that way, let me start by working with the double arrow first. Is the first branch open or closed? Well, notice it closes right off the bat because of the tilde R and R on this side. And the other side, well, the other side still stays open. Now let me take a look at what these other lines are. Here's an R and an M, and that's what I happen to have here is an M and an R. So this time, let me work on this line. That's a wedge. That would give me tilde R on one side, M on the other. Tilde R and R, well, that closes. M and tilde M, that closes. I'm done already. In this particular case, I didn't even have to work on the first line and I still finished the tree. If every branch closes, even if you haven't worked on everything, you do have a valid argument. Now, this doesn't always work. This is just a peculiar argument in which this was a possibility. If you're going to do a bunch of trees, it would be a good idea to sort of think about the formulas before you worked on them, and sometimes you would have much more efficient results.